Great, thank you so much. Um, and let's see if this works. Um, can at least one person confirm with me that they can see this? Great. <laughs> um, okay, so let me just change it slightly. Yeah, great. Um, to there we go. So uh, my name is Ben Hutton. I'm the managing director of Xdesign. Um, we help organisations with digital transformation through web and mobile apps, and we have been in business for almost ten years. And before that, I was an associate partner at Cello Group, and before that, in various other agencies. So essentially, in almost 20 years, I have seen thousands of briefs, and they become particularly thick and fast, uh, X design, I have to say, um, across a massive range of projects, from things that people think about as apps, for like Visit Scotland, uh, we've made the VR app, through to the aviation auditing system for Menzies, or the Federation of uh, Industry Sector Skills and Standards Apprenticeship Certification System. Um, and all of these projects, for all of these clients, they all ultimately started with some brief. Um, so that we could understand the requirements. So what is a bad brief? To be clear, it's not one that is just short of detail. That's not necessarily bad. A bad brief is one that purports to exist to have the potential supplier understand the requirements um, and almost always so they can either go to pitch and give costs and times. When they go bad is when no understanding has gone into the creation of the brief itself. And perhaps you're thinking, why does it matter if the brief is bad? Isn't that really just a problem for, for me as an agency? And, and of course it is. It results in less accurate quotes, less insightful pitches. But the main problem is bad briefs are a sign of bad understanding of requirements. And also, no one really gives anybody any feedback because briefs are the gateway to work. So no one ever wants to tell the writer that what they've written is terrible. Um, so let's talk about what makes terrible briefs today. And I want to start by telling you a story, a well-worn story, in fact, um, about the space race and American astronauts and Russian cosmonauts trying to find a way to write in zero gravity. And the story goes that in trying to find a solution, the Americans spent millions of dollars in developing a pen that writes in zero gravity, the space pen, and the Russians used a pencil. And we like that story, right? There's something about it that appeals to how we think about the cliches about Americans and Russians, the penalty of excess and the resourcefulness and frugalness of Russians. But the story is wrong. I mean, it's factually incorrect, but we can forgive that of a story if it makes a great point. But the moral of the story, what we take away from it, what we learn from that story is wrong. So, what is the problem with the story? What is the problem with the Russians using a pencil? Well, there are a number of things you don't want floating around in space. Some key examples might be flammable kindling and razor blades, um, also known as pencil sharpeners and shavings. And the original plan of using a pencil didn't work. So that, there's no surprise there. They made the fundamental problem of any digital transformation project. They've just said, let's use this existing process but now it's in a new environment. So they have to procure something different. They have to buy something. And they go, aha, the problem with pencils is that they have to sharpen them. That, that's the problem. We know the solution to this. We'll get pencils that you don't need to sharpen. Both the Russians and Americans did this. So they write a solution-based brief. They buy the most robust mechanical pencil that you can imagine. They spec the best thing money can buy. And buy them they did at $165 a pencil and that's $165 in 1960s money which today is about $1,500 each. Well problem solved right? Well you know you don't want floating about in space. You don't want tiny razor sharp rods of graphite that float into people's eyes and in another fun incident cause sparks when they float into ventilation systems. So NASA goes, we've got clever people. How difficult can it be to deliver this writing instrument? So they start to try to do it themselves. It's a side of the table activity for many of their engineers and they work on it for years. The Russians go a different way. They double down on the pencil 
idea. Um, they go with these, these grease pencils, which is um, you unwrap the wax paper around them to expose this sort of nub to, to write with. Um, and that's actually the pencil that's talked about in the story where we say the Russians used a pencil. And they used this for years. Um, it does such a job, bad job of writing on paper, they actually had to bring special plastic slates, um, which inexplicably had a paper cover on them that they couldn't dispose of. Um, and the whole thing's combustible and made such poor notes it actually discouraged people from writing. Now, remember, both of these groups have literally managed to get people into space using slide rules. But NASA's writing instrument program has run up so much internal costs with nothing to show for it that that gets abandoned and then enter the Fisher Space Company. Um, so the manufacturer, these are the manufacturers of the space pen and they solve the problem by combining the new and the old. And, and the space pen is in fact a bit of a misnomer because as Fisher understood, it was actually the internal, the, the unseen, it's the, the ink cartridge itself that's special. The infrastructure of the pen changes and it's just wrapped in something sort of pleasing and, and familiar. And the Americans go on to buy 400 of these pens and they're about $6 each. And the Russians, the Russians who so cleverly used the pencil, well, in 1969, they place an order for the Fisher space pens after all. So what do we learn from this parable, this, this story of transformation. Well, your brief can not just be, let's do the same thing, but, but it transplant it wholesale into a different environment. Your brief cannot just be the what without the why. You can't just know nothing about the subject and hope for the best. You have to understand the requirements. So let's talk for a minute about understanding. So that journey from a man going into space with his pencil, in 1961, everyone having space pens was eight years. So depending on how you look at it, that's a short or a long time. Eight years to buy a pen or eight years to understand how to make a permanent record of activity in zero gravity that's inert and stands the rigors of leaving and re-entering Earth's atmosphere. Either way, though, it isn't contentious to say that what was needed was an understanding of the challenges and complexities of the problem something that is largely missing from most briefs. Because understanding is built from other things. It's built from knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is the collective information and facts that are gathered through education and experience. Wisdom is judging how and when to apply that knowledge. And you get understanding when you get the realization of the impact that knowledge and wisdom has and you place it in context and know how to execute. So bad briefs often come right from the beginning when people think they have knowledge through experience. And the problem is that we, on a daily basis, trivialize the amount of time and effort needed to make something digital because it can become almost background radiation to our lives. It's become unnoticed and unappreciated. So if you take something like this, the Queen's Ferry Crossing, it's a modern marvel of engineering. It started in 2011, um, it was completed in about six years. It carries 24 million vehicles and it took 10 million man hours with a team of almost 2,000 people. This is Uber, a modern marvel of engineering, started in 2011 and six years later had 68 million users. It has over 10 million engineering man hours with a team of 2,000 engineers. So often a brief that should be what we want to get you across the fourth becomes, we want you to build us a bridge when what you needed was a boat. Now, knowledge also comes from education, but we are in an industry which has a peculiar reluctance for people who consider themselves non-digital or non-technical to educate themselves. We will frequently deal with people who can passionately expound the virtues of a type of frame for the mountain bike, but not think there's any value in that geek stuff which underpins their technical choices. And because of that, many of the bad briefs we get show a complete lack of education whatsoever. So let's take, for example, a simple software engineering pr principle like unit testing. Um, so unit testing is the act of taking the smallest testable part of any software and, and essentially you write a contract for it. You, you validate that the unit works as designed. And 
if you imagine that the software you've developed is a pointillism painting, every dot is a piece of code. And on the day you have your project delivered, it, it will look right. Um, there may be the wrong dot here and there, but picking those out amongst the other dots just by eye won't, won't happen. But then you want to make a change to your painting. You'll want to extend it or alter it and some more dots will change. And then you have to work out why and go back and recolor the dots if you can remember what it was meant to look like. Um, unit testing tells the dots what color they should be and alerts you or stops you from making a change that breaks that contract. It's a fundamental part of test-driven test -driven development, of, of quality of engineering, on focusing on the ink and not just the shape of the pen. And it's completely missing from almost every brief that we get. And, and you see, it's not just automatic because writing good tests take time, maybe three times as long as just bashing out the code. So if you don't know to ask for it and the developer doesn't have to do it, then what will make it get done? Without knowledge of the key elements of how something is put together, how can you understand it? Here's another famous quote. I mean, he probably didn't say it. Um, and the moral of this quote is often misunderstood because it's not an argument against user testing. It's an argument against asking users what they wanted, not what they were doing, how they did it, what the, were the problems. And I'm going to show you an example of how that manifests itself in a brief. So here's an example of that in action. This thing um, comes about because people ask users what they wanted, then converted that straight into a brief. So this is only a few weeks old, believe it or not. Um, and this is one for one of the largest global NGOs on the planet. And what you're looking at is a way in which a user can tell if there's an issue with data that has been uploaded. So these little graphs, they all start off white, and then the user looks for gaps in the data, physical white gaps in the, in the graphs, and if they see a gap, they click it, and then they mark it amber, um, and if they then go back and confirm it is a gap, they mark it red, and that opens up a side panel here, which lets them copy and paste the information into an email to send it back to the person that they originally got it from. And this seems to the, use, the, the person who was originally using this a great idea, because this is an evolution from the existing system they have, which is everybody emails them just spreadsheets. And then they take those spreadsheets and they found that the easiest way for them as individual users to work out if data was missing was to fire up a graph in Excel and then look at it by eye. So having the graphs made automatically seemed like an amazing solution to this. Um, but this is not a brief written from understanding. The people writing it have felt they've understood what it was, but it's, it's knowledge without wisdom, without the context of knowing how to apply what they're being told, because clearly there is a way to do all of this data checking automatically. This is completely unnecessary. Um, the requirement for this data could have been have us um, let us be able to see if data is missing and automatically alert somebody. But this this isn't just a one-off. There's a 300-page brief, and that concept of how data is is held and still in spreadsheets and still manually checked has its tendrils throughout the whole thing and makes it almost impossible to answer well. This tender also does not have a budget. Most, um, most tenders, most briefs do not have a budget and that's because there seems to be this idea that if you say you have £10, we'll say it's 9 99 So the pattern ends up going something like this. Um, Shh, don't, don't tell them how much we should spend, how much we want to spend. Maybe they'll come back and say it's way cheaper. Okay, so can you build us the Queen's Ferry Crossing, please? And, and so we say, well, that'll take quite a long time to, to work out. Why do you need to know that? And then you might say, well, we'll tell the winning bidder that. Um, how much is it going to cost? Uh, about £1.3 billion. Pounds? Uh, ah, okay, well, we only have £200,000. How much of a bridge can you build for that? Well, we, we can't really, uh, oh, but we've got a company in India that says it can make a flexible crossing system. And, and we go, well, that, that's a tightrope. And someone says they can sell up the chain as an MVP. And, and that's how we end up getting these briefs or, or it gets paired with, well, you tell us how much it is and we'll work out if we can afford it. And, and in a bizarre way, I almost prefer the tightrope version 
because it at least shows that someone has thought about it. Often though we see no budgets included because a crucial piece of work simply hasn't been done. What's the return on investment for this? How are we going to calculate success? And you may be sitting there um, hidden behind the screen, if anyone's still there, um, laughing at all of this, thinking it sounds very old fashioned, having all these fixed requirements, and that wouldn't happen to you because you're going to build it in an agile fashion. Well, that can result in even worse briefs because um, this, this is from a drinks company. Um, this drinks company that we did work with was very keen on agile development. In fact, proving the, to the business that agile could work um, and that they could get success quickly and training people up to be product owners, that, that was a part of the requirements right up until it hit procurement. Um, and that little note on the side is directly from procurement where it sat in hell for about a month to two months because procurement didn't know how to buy agile. Um, they wanted us to break down exactly what each thing was going to deliver, exactly when it was going to be delivered, but still have the um, flexibility of changing everything. The, the cake and eat it model for Agile. And the reality is there's a lot about written about Agile in the pure white ball of energy version and far less in a client vendor enterprise relationship where failing fast is only possible if you succeed quickly. So we manage that through a, this managed Agile framework that adds project management as laser focus on deliverables and dependencies. But what we see is an increasing number of briefs that claim to want to build in an Agile fashion. But what they mean is a stop, start, unorganized fashion. And that's not Agile. Agile is about delivering the highest value items first and constantly testing and validating those priorities. And priorities or lack of them is another facet of bad briefs. So collating requirements without understanding. Um, here's not an uncommon start for briefs that we get. Um, someone's got everyone around the table to understand the requirements. And this is a list of 300 or so must have requirements that we got um, for an aviation system. Um, and it was gonna be rolled out to 209 airports around the world. And they got people from security and from kiosks and from cargo and all the departments to, to feed in the requirements. Um, and, and just to zoom in on a couple of these must have, they're all must have requirements. Um, so that first one it basically is impossible um, and would require some new development um, of, of, of that, that was a new super hardy phone. Um, the bottom one, is uh, that that Memo Amigo, their Vodafone's proprietary tech from 2001. Um, it turns out an island airport was still using six devices, but a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of wisdom would have told them that it would be cheaper to buy six new Android tablets than to find a, a multi-million pound system to be backwards compatible to a two decades old defunct system, and that would be madness. And, that might seem like an extreme example, but in the last two months for major organizations, phrase, this phrase has crept into each of the briefs. It should be compatible with all existing and all future systems, as if that won't be a problem. Which leads us to talk about non-functional requirements. So these are the things that define system attributes and they hardly ever make it into briefs because they're, I think, probably because they're hidden from a lot of people and, and maybe, frankly, slightly boring. Um, it covers security, reliability, performance, maintainability, scalability, usability, and to some degree, accessibility. Um, but if we think about it as building a house and what you would need, the information you would need to give somebody to build something physical, um, uh, it's no different, you know, how many, what area do you need it to be in? How many people does it need to hold later? You can't turn a bungalow into a skyscraper. Are you living in the house yourself or selling it to others? How valuable is what's being kept inside? Who's going to look after the maintenance? Um, all of these things are legitimate um, questions to ask. And it's no different when we're making a digital product for you. So how do you climb this mountain to, to better briefs? Um, well, you can increase your knowledge, wisdom, and to get to better understanding. Um, if uh, there are a number of courses on, on software and UX, CodeClan offer a number of one to three day courses that offer insight into what development is and does and provides facts about what's difficult and hard. And indeed, the act of simply trying to understand what's difficult and hard and thinking that digital isn't just an unknowable magisteria. 
Um, there are also just three books that I would recommend. Um, the first is User Story Mapping by Jeff Patton, and, and that acts as a great introduction to, to how to think about looking at the whole story of a product and unearthing what people need and how to actually build out a plan. Um, the second might seem like an odd selection. It's, it's the Challenger Sale by Matthew Dixon, but challenge is the key to building wisdom, not just years. Years doing the same thing over and over don't build wisdom. Wisdom is forged by being a challenger and not just a relationship builder, by asking why and inviting constructive tension. And the third is by Jake Knapp, the design sprint process, which was honed by Google Ventures as a way to validate ideas before they were being invested in, in a very short space of time. And, and while I'm not necessarily advocating that you do design sprints per se, the tips and tools and workshops about understanding success is invaluable. And then it's a process of understanding success for the end user, for the team members involved, and for the organization. I understand that we're in a user-focused design world, but in a user-focused design world, milk is at the front of the shop. The reason milk is at the back of the shop is what the store owner needs the, the person to do matters as well. Building simple personas, simple effective personas, which are synthesized profiles of typical, not average users. They've got a really bad name over the years as they've been bastardized by marketing to essentially just become demographics. But they have two major benefits. The act of creating them is unifying, and they also provide protection from what Alan Cooper referred to as the elastic user. That's for most of us, the boss that shows up and says, why can't it be more yellow? By reframing those conversations around the benefits to a particular persona provides a safe space for challenge. And, and they have to be practical. They just need to cover the environment and context. Uh, what, what are they trying to do um, and what sort of time frame? The goals and tasks, what has to get done and what's the point and the motivations and needs, why are they doing it and what's going to cause them pain? And then you take those and you map out the as is and you map out those things with a focus on what the pain points are. Map out, and by map out, we, it can be very fancy, or it can simply be post-its on a wall or on a digital wall. And you're trying to avoid so solutions at this point. You're just simply trying to get to the pain points. And you're wrapping that into the constraints, time, budget, or how budget will be calculated, or what would make a return on investment, existing technical infrastructure, and non-functional requirement considerations. Then, and basically only then, from a place of understanding should you write your brief. Because without this understanding, we're all just trying to sharpen pencils in space. Okay, so that's the end of the me talking bit, hopefully. So uh, thank you very much. I've been Ben at Exdesign, uh, where we can help you solve a problem, exploit an opportunity, validate an idea, build a solution. And if you have any questions, let me know. I'll even put on my video. Don't all shout at once. Let me see the little Q&A panel. Yeah, just a reminder for everyone, if you have any questions at all for Ben, if you use the, uh, the chat panel on the right hand side, I'll just give it a couple of minutes, see if any, any questions come through. Well, people decide if they're going to write anything or just start eating their sandwiches. I will say that one of the things I didn't um, include in there, because perhaps it's so obvious that, that it, was, um, it seems almost ridiculous to bring it up, but um, it's happened a lot of times recently. Um, people simply using the um, uh, old templates for new projects. I mean, that sounds entirely obvious, but it, and it often comes through procurement. So I find myself just two weeks ago um, uh, being asked to apply, answer a, an app brief for one of the large utilities companies. And one of the, the um, uh, things that was asked was, uh, one of the things that was asked in the procurement program, which had to be completed, and we confirmed it had to be completed, was our perimeter fencing policy. Um, because they had simply lifted and shifted the default um, supplier um, questionnaire. And it just took them, and so we had to do, 
we now have an excellent perimeter fencing policy if anybody wants to look at it but it seems obvious that though and those things are morale sapping or time sapping if there's if you've created this wonderful brief done all these things you said but then it gets lopped on to a 300 question procurement questionnaire that no one's taken any time over it's really demoralizing so thank you paul um how do you get around the client who thinks they want one thing but you think they need something else well we tell people um, so, for example, um, if what they want is, um, if what they want doesn't match the success criteria, then hopefully that's a way of, of showing it. Um, we do a, um, a formal process called validate. So, for example, we did this with um, working with Heineken, for example, where what they thought they wanted was um, a portal for publicans. Um, because getting more information would be a better tool. We then built out a prototype and tested that with a small group of people, um, five or six, and it showed that actually the tool itself um, would be better used for their account managers um, and that the users had different needs. I mean, it sounds very trite and cliche to say, ask the users, but we were able to show that physically show them and demonstrate to them that, that there was something else that was needed. The thing that's often, um, the element of that that often comes true is around budget, that uh, people often think they need a lot um, more than they do um, and plan whole roadmaps before they've understood what's needed. So we have a sort of discovery process that we build out uh, a build plan for, which then gives relative magnitudes um, through story points of different efforts so that we're able to kind of frame that for customers and clients to be able to say, um, uh, um, that was able to frame that for customers and clients by going, okay, this thing is like eight story points, uh, but, but these eight things are all one. So which one do you want more? Because then that helps formulate and give an education to what was uh, what has value. Um, does anybody have anything else or is it sandwich time? Do you think, do you not think that having a basic understanding of Roma is essential when looking for budget? Uh, it, it absolutely is essential for, for looking uh, um, for, for budget because the decisions that you, you don't want to make a technical cul-de-sac, right, um, is one of those things that, that um, you, to that point I was making earlier about if you're making a bungalow that needs to and potentially convert to a skyscraper, you might make some decisions um, that are different uh, for your initial uh, for your initial release. Um, I think it is is very important. I think what people do is make, um, there's a difference between understanding where you might want to go and predefining what uh, is going to land successfully with different people. How much should a business understand about its challenge before consulting an agency and what do they need to know in advance? Um, I think they only really need to know in advance before speaking to someone what the problem is, what their existing systems are, their budget, and have an idea for success users, uh, success for users and success for business, the business itself. I think if you have a good understanding of those sort of five key things, then you're probably ready to start going on the journey. Um, so now I feel like I'm giving everybody very short shift answers for things that are, you know, massive points. Any more rapid fire questions in the one minute we have left? Or by all means, feel free to properly have a conversation with me um, once I work out how to go onto our booth immediately after this. Someone will explain that to me, I'm sure. No other questions coming through, Ben, but as you say, you know, so, so many things to talk about and in, in a lot more depth by all means. So. If anyone uh, does wish to follow up on that conversation or wants to pick Ben's brains about anything